dear friends and colleagues all around the world. I am Olav Njelstad, director of the Norwegian Nobel Institute here in Oslo, Norway. It is a great pleasure to welcome you all to the Nobel Peace Prize Forum 2020 on international cooperation after COVID-19. Organized by the Nobel Institute and the University of Oslo, this year's forum will address the possible effects of the corona pandemic on international cooperation and world order today and in the years ahead. While most experts agree that the pandemic is not only a severe public health crisis, but also a potential game changer in world affairs, they disagree on whether it will strengthen or weaken multilateralism and the present rules-based international order. These are among the broader questions we will discuss today. 19 years ago, upon receiving the Nobel Peace Prize for 2001 together with the United Nations, the late Secretary General Kofi Annan defined the mission of the UN for the 21st century as follows, to fight poverty, prevent conflict, and cure disease. The rapid spread of the coronavirus across the globe has made this already formidable triple task far more difficult. With close to 70 million people infected, more than one and a half million deaths, a possible 100% increase in the number of people threatened by hunger, and a projected 5% reduction in GDP worldwide, our common future is indeed in dire straits. To help us better understand what action the world community must now take to overcome this crisis and prepare ourselves for the next, it is a privilege to introdu introduce the UN Secretary General, Mr. Antoni Guterres, as today's keynote speaker and guest of honor. His most timely topic will be multilateralism and global governance in the wake of the corona pandemic. Mr. Secretary General, the floor is yours. Excellencies, distinguished panelists, ladies and gentlemen, it is a pleasure to join the Nobel Peace Prize Forum for the discussion of multilateralism and global governance in the aftermath of the COVID-19 pandemic. The pandemic is a crisis like no other, in which the world faces a common enemy. Unfortunately, governments have not mounted a joint response to this global threat. From the start, the World Health Organization provided factual information and scientific guidance that should have been the basis for coordinated global action. But response has been fragmented and chaotic, with countries, regions, and even cities competing against each other for essential supplies and frontline workers. We cannot let the same thing happen for access to new COVID-19 vaccines, which must be a global public good. The social and economic impact of the pandemic is enormous and growing. No vaccine can undo the damage that has already been done. We face the biggest global recession in eight decades. Extreme poverty is rising, the threat of famine looms. These intergenerational impacts are the result of long-term fragilities, inequalities and injustices that have been exposed by the pandemic. We need a reset. In March, I appealed for a global ceasefire so that countries can focus on fighting the virus. I echoed this call in my speech to the General Assembly in September and urged new efforts to silence the guns by the end of the year. I'm encouraged by the support this call has received and by the positive response by governments to my call for peace in homes around the world and an end to violence against women and girls. From the start, the United Nations had advocated for a stimulus package worth at least 10% of global GDP and for debt relief for all countries that need it. Many low- and middle-income developing countries need immediate support to avert a liquidity crisis. They are being forced to choose between providing basic services for their people and servicing their debts. The initiative we launched with the Prime Ministers of Canada and Jamaica has developed policy options for financing the response to COVID-19 and putting us back on course to achieve the Sustainable Development Goals. These include increasing the resources available to the International Monetary Fund 
through a new allocation of special drawing rights to the benefit of developing countries, and a voluntary reallocation of unused special drawing rights. I also hope the G20 debt initiatives will be broadened so that all vulnerable developing countries are eligible, including all middle-income countries that need debt relief. In the longer term, we need a reformed global architecture to enhance debt transparency and sustainability. I'm pressing for these policies in all my global engagements and most recently at the G20. Excellencies, the severe limitations of global cooperation and governance extend far beyond the pandemic. The erosion of the nuclear disarmament regime and the lawless frontiers of cyberspace are just two areas that could produce a full-blown global emergency within the next decade. I spoke last week of our suicidal war on nature. Without urgent action, we may be headed for a catastrophic three to five degree temperature rise this century. Every year, fires and floods, cyclones and hurricanes break new records, causing the greatest devastation to those who did least to contribute to global heating and are least equipped to deal with it. I see signs of hope in the growing coalition led by young people, civil society, businesses, cities and regions pushing for urgent climate action. Mindsets are gradually shifting. The European Union, the UK, Japan, the Republic of Korea, and more than 100 countries have committed to achieve carbon neutrality by 2050. The central objective of the United Nations for 2021 is to build a truly global coalition for carbon neutrality. China has already joined with 260 as the horizon. But every country, city, financial institution, and company should adopt plans for transitioning to the net zero emissions by 2050. And I encourage the main emitters to lead the way by taking decisive decisions now. Carbon should be given a price. Fossil fuel subsidies should end. Coal must be phased out. We must shift the tax burden from income to carbon, from taxpayers to polluters. The recovery from the COVID-19 pandemic is an opportunity to build this momento into a movement and to integrate the goal of carbon neutrality into every economic and fiscal policy and decision. Excellencies, 2020 is the 75th anniversary of the United Nations. To mark the occasion, the UN General Assembly invited me to assess how we can best respond to current and future challenges and to report back with analysis and recommendations. I have launched the process to engage with government, civil society, thought leaders and others on how to reinvigorate multilateralism. The COVID-19 pandemic provides overwhelming evidence that we need more and more effective multilateralism with vision, ambition and impact. We cannot respond to this crisis by going back to what was or withdrawing into national shells. We need more international cooperation and stronger international institutions. The consultation process should address the inequalities and the foundations of uh, the present global power relations. The nations that came out on top more than seven decades ago have refused to contemplate the necessary reforms. The composition and voting rights in the United Nations Security Council or the boards of the Bretton Woods system are a case in point. Many African countries did not even exist as independent states 75 years ago. They deserve their rightful place at the global table. The developing world more broadly must have a far stronger voice in global decision making. An effort to improve global governance must take this into account. Excellencies, reforming global governance must be one step towards creating a fairer world that can solve shared problems before they overwhelm us. We need global governance structures that deliver on critical global public goods including public health, climate action, sustainable development, and peace. In addition to more inclusive and equal participation in global institutions, we need a global financial architecture that recognizes the need for solidarity in the face of global threats. A more inclusive and balanced multilateral trading system will enable developing countries to move up global value chains. And we need to reduce and end illicit financial flows, money laundering, and tax evasion, including through achieving a global consensus to end tax havens. And we need to integrate the principles of sustainable development into financial decision-making. Models of consumption and production should respect the rights and dignity of each other and of future generations. All countries have agreed to implement the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development and the 17 Sustainable Development Goals. And yet, 
I spent much of my time urging governments to implement the global goals, the Paris Agreement, and the Addis Ababa action agenda. Empty promises erode trust in public institutions. Excellencies, multilateral cooperation should be firmly based on the universal values of community, solidarity, equality, and humanity. Recognizing the fundamental human rights of all and providing opportunities for all. None of these is a call for new bureaucracies. We need multilateralism that delivers. 21st century multilateralism must be networked. It should link the United Nations family with other global institutions, from international financial institutions to regional organizations and trade alliances. And 21st century multilateralism must be inclusive. Today's United Nations must go beyond governments to recognize the role of civil society, regions and cities, business and academic institutions. We need to expand our circle of engagement to draw in, this perspect in the perspectives and expertise of all these sectors and more. The commitment to climate action is now mobilizing governments at national and local levels, companies, civil society and individuals. That is the future of multilateralism. Excellencies, today's crisis can and must be turned into an opportunity for change. The Nobel Committee showed the way by awarding this Peace Prize to the World Food Programme. WFP is the embodiment of an effective global organization. It operates above the realm of politics, based on humanitarian values, our responsibility to people in need. The prize recognizes the essential link between feeding the hungry, solidarity with those in need, and world peace. The COVID-19 crisis has shown above all the urgent need for human solidarity. Global governments must be based on the recognition that such solidarity is not only a moral imperative, it is in everyone's interests. We can only tackle shared threats through shared resolve. Thank you. And thank you, Mr. Antonio Guterres, for this rather clear-cut message. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Christian Wurtke, and I'm the moderator for this year's Nobel Peace Prize Forum. To open our deliberations, let me present you to a political icon, former Prime Minister of Norway, former Director General of the World's Health Organization, presently co-chair of the UN Global Preparedness Monitoring uh, Board, Gro Harlem Brundtland. And Mrs. Brundtland, what is your immediate reaction to the message we just heard from the Secretary General? I think he, he gave us really the road to move ahead on. It was uh, a strong message, and really <laughs> there is every reason to support him in what he said. We need global governance, which is for the 21st century. And that means strengthening the system to both cover public health, climate, sustainable development, and peace, as he said. And he added something important. We need to have inclusiveness. We must now have a governance system that goes beyond the governments, that also uh, serves civil society, uh, business, the academic community. Uh, it needs to be an inclusive governance system for the 21st century. We can do it. You have a unique experience from organized efforts to prevent, contain, and combat pandemics from your position as the head of the WHO. I wonder, why is COVID-19 affecting the world so much harder than the previous pandemic of SARS? I think uh, there are several differences. Uh, this coronavirus was, is more infectious it spreads more quickly uh, than the SARS virus. It is also not so deadly as the SARS. So it hasn't scared all people the way the SARS did. More people than before are not really taking it seriously enough. And I'm sorry to say, maybe also some countries have not taken it seriously enough. So this is, then, then we have the situation that the world was not prepared, uh, a world at risk, since we haven't been following up our own decision-making after the experiences of SARS, 
several others and through Ebola in 2014. The world was not prepared. The WHO has been criticized not only by the American president, but is this criticism justified? I think we have to see that uh, the whole system, the global system, including the WHO, all the countries were not empowered enough, not prepared enough to face a crisis like this. However, when you look at WHO, it's it, like many other of our international institutions, it's under-resourced. It is also under-empowered compared to what it needs to be because sometimes member states want to take care of their own sovereignty in the idea that they don't want to be dominated by an international institution. However, what we have seen and learned now from COVID is that we need a strengthened WHO. We need to support it. It's a member state organization. And I also have to say, China did not report as quickly as it should, not even this time, and kept the WHO back because it was not reporting. So now we need a stronger WHO, one that has direct access to any country, any time it sees the need. In a recent keynote uh, address, you said something like, COVID-19 has taken advantage of the world in disorder. Uh, what concrete measures should be pursued to enhance the understanding of multilateral co uh, cooperation? You know, the, the GPMB, the Global Preparedness Monitoring Board that I co-chair, mm -hmm. we have followed this situation. We have warned the world, the world about uh, we are in crisis, we are at risk, then we are in disorder. Uh, and now even the situation itself has increased that disorder, and we see that we have not tackled this pandemic the way we should. So it means strengthening the preparedness in every country across the world and strengthening our global system to be able to respond, first of all, to prevent and then to respond to a crisis like this one. And that means that the multilateral system and every country has to be moving forward to prepare in a better way than what has been the case so far. So you, you could say that COVID has taught us a necessary lesson, brutal but crystal clear. This time it is very clear. Um, you know, the Ebola situation was dangerous, but most countries in most parts of the world did not experience it. It was in some African countries, it moved to a couple of European and into US, which made it, you know, a global concern uh, however, the follow-up has not been sufficient. This time, every country is affected, every community across the world. So if leaders now don't stand up and understand, present leaders, that they have to make an, uh, other types of decisions about our future, I don't know what kinds of lessons people need to have. In your time, you chaired the Brundtland Commission on Sustainable Development in the World, and you are a long-time member of the ELDES, which is the uh, Nelson Mandela uh, Group of Independent Global Leaders. In both capacities, you have been a very strong proponent of multilateral cooperation. Could you tell us a bit how these ideals developed? I mean, what were the background for your uh, attitude towards these questions? Well, I was uh, lucky to gr grow up with uh, the values of solidarity, justice, and uh, equality. Then I realized that even in my own country, Norway, there is discrimination against girls and women. Even in the democratic Norway, in my young age. So that was one of my, became one of my issues, um, overcoming discrimination against women. Then I became a public health uh, person. And then I became the Minister of Environment in Norway, and then learned that we don't <clears throat> only have to have solidarity and have responsibility for each other. We have to have responsibility for nature. 
to take care of planet Earth so that coming generation can survive and thrive on a planet that is in order, not in <clears throat> disorder. So these experiences, these values, and they have added, you know, when decades have passed in my own life, have just made me even more convinced about we are in this together. There is no alternative to uh, global cooperation, to cross-country collaboration. That's the only way forward for our common future. Thank you to Gro Harlem Brundtland for a highly spirited and very personal message there. And then, ladies and gentlemen, let's turn to the panelists of today's forum. We have with us, first and for all, David Beasley, Executive Director of the World Food Program, the winner of this year's Nobel Peace Prize, with us from his headquarters in Rome. We have Ina Eriksen Sørreide, uh, who is Norway's Minister of Foreign Affairs, in person by my side here in the uh, ceremonial hall of the Aula of the University of Oslo. And we have Robert Malley, president and CEO of the esteemed think tank International Crisis Group, participating from the US main office of the group in Washington, DC. Welcome to all of you. So I'd like to start with David Beasley. What challenges has the COVID pandemic imposed on the practical work of the food program since its outbreak? You can only imagine when COVID hit and the supply chain disruptions, when westernized, very modern countries like the United States and European nations were having trouble just getting toilet paper. If that's happening in some of the most sophisticated supply chain systems in the world, you can imagine what would be happening in Niger or Mali or Burkina Faso. So it has really had a dramatic impact in multiple ways. First and foremost, it created an economic ripple effect and supply chain disruption that really has created chaos and disruption in so many ways. In fact, the number of people on the brink of starvation right before COVID was right at 135 million people. That number has spiked to 270 million people. Now, when you break that down country by country, each country is uniquely different because of different scenarios. And you can imagine if we do not get in and provide the assistance that these people need, you will have famine, destabilization and mass migration but in the meantime before we get to that as to disruption what we're facing moving supplies as you can imagine we assist about 100 million people on any given day week or month so moving supplies while there's uh shutdowns shutdown of ports logistics centers distribution points has created an incredible number of headaches on top of that we've had for example you had 1.6 billion children out of school uh, with the, at the height of the shutdown. Out of that, about 370 million of those children uh, got school meals. And out of that, a number of those children, that was the only meal they got per day. So in working with governments, we had to shift our modality so that these children who were no longer in school, that's the only meal they get. We were trying every way possible to make certain they get that meal. Otherwise, they will die from starvation or they will be wasting and their nutritional system would deteriorate, which means they'll be vulnerable, not only to COVID, but diphtheria, cholera, or whatever the case may be. So we've been all hands on deck. And also not, not many people realize this. They realize obviously that we feed a lot of people in a lot of different ways around the world, but we are also the logistics humanitarian backbone for the humanitarian system and the United Nations system. So we are the ones when the airline industry was shutting down and not traveling and flying into countries, particularly low and middle income countries, we were the ones that picked up uh, that responsibility uh, by moving literally 100,000 metric meters with regards to supplies, COVID supplies, as well as passengers, doctors, first responders, uh, you, you name it. So we're out there uh, in every capacity in about 171 countries, we were shipping supplies to, uh, as well as thousands upon thousands of passengers. Now that the airline industry is coming back online, it's allowing us uh, to decrease that footprint and stay focused on the things that are critical right now, because we have famine knocking at the door of many, many countries, but we'll get more into detail of that uh, later. 
You're obviously talking about extremely complicated and very complex operations here, and it's interesting to hear that the UN chief calls the World Food Programme as the embodiment of international organizations. But, but tell me, how may the Peace Prize strengthen your position and your future role and activities in a way? Well, in a major way, I think there, quite frankly, most of the people on Earth have not realized how fragile the world is, how many problems we're facing, because, you know, honestly, uh, and Ina and I have talked about that. The foreign minister have talked about this. And when, when you cut on the TV and the news in the last three or four years, it's either Trump, 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 or Brexit, Brexit, Brexit. And there's been very little coverage with regards to the wars, the conflicts, the destabilization, the hunger issues that are facing dozens of countries around the world. And so what the Nobel Peace Prize Committee has done is, I think, two very significant, powerful things. And one is saying, thank you, to the women and men and men, women and men at the World Food Program for what you're doing and risking your lives, putting your lives on the line every day to bring peace and stability and help solve hunger, give the security and stability that are needed in many fragile nations, number one. Number two, our hardest work is really right ahead of us in 2021. And it's a call to action, a call to action that if we don't act, it's gonna cost the world I think in this catastrophic ways. But if we get ahead of the curve, we can avoid famine, we can avoid uh, destabilization of nations, and we can avoid mass migration. If we don't do that, it's not only will we have those three things, but the cost is a thousand times more than going in and prevention and doing it right. And so it's a call to action, and the Nobel Peace Prize Committee in my opinion, has done a magnificent honor, not just to us, but a responsibility call to the rest of the world, a wake-up call to the rest of the world. Uh, you know, Eric, we, we have recently seen quite clearly how vulnerable the world actually is. Could you tell us a bit, how has the worldwide uh, COVID pandemic actually influenced on foreign policy? I mean, how has it been carrying out practical foreign policy in this situation? Well, I think we have to, well, to split the answer oh, yeah. into, uh, into two. One thing is, of course, the practical side, not being able to meet and, and doing things like this, which are, of course, a very good substitute if you cannot meet physically. Uh, but I think, to be very honest, that it has also exacerbated some of the potential conflicts uh, that we have around the world because people are unable to talk to each other face to face and to actually solve differences in a, in a normal way. At least they are able to do so in, at a much lesser extent than what they've been used to. But secondly, uh, of course, the COVID pandemic and I would say the consequences of the pandemic, both the, the short term ones and the long term ones, they are actually just adding on trouble to the already challenging issues we have on, on our plate today. And if we look at some of the points that David mentioned on, on famine, on mass migration, on vulnerable states, uh, and also the fact that you could potentially have conflict bursting out, these are just examples of what I think we will have to deal with, not only for 2021, but for the years to come. Uh, it has turned upside down much of what we were used to thinking. I, I've sometimes warned against the idea that we've seen like a, a linear way upwards from 1990 till now. But now we are experiencing the biggest and deepest downturn since the 1930s. We are seeing that in many countries, the economic and social consequences are bigger than the actual health consequences as of now. And the path to recovery and to getting out of this, uh, this situation is very, very gloomy and difficult in many countries. I just got a paper uh, in my ministry a couple of days ago analyzing uh, what this will mean for reaching the SDGs. And more or less straightforward, it will be impossible to reach the SDGs within 2030. Uh, and also, especially, we are now experiencing for the first time in 22 years the number of extreme poor people growing again. So, so all of this adds together in a very toxic mix, um, which can be very, very difficult to deal with. If you add 
on top of all of that, um, the fact that we, in this situation, could only need more multilateral and in international cooperation, whereas the big paradox is that many big states are pulling out of that international cooperation. And, and no one state can deal with any of this alone. Not a small state, not a big state. So we, we just have to cooperate. And my hope is that this will be also a wake-up call for those who are, are kind of pulling out of international cooperation, that they have to get back in. A potential wake-up call, yes. But how do you expect it all to influence on Norway's position in the Security Council of the, of the, uh, of the UN? You're starting mm -hmm. up with that two-year period mm -hmm. on the 1st of January. Mm -hmm. We're getting very close, uh, and it's, of course, difficult to predict exactly how these two years will, will play out. Um, our experience from the last time we were in the Council 20 years ago was also that events has a tendency to stir up everything you plan for. But I do think that we can be quite sure uh, of one thing. Um, our four priorities in the Council they are, if anything, more relevant when we look, look at the situation right now. I mean, mm -hmm. we made those priorities a long time ago. Uh, the four of them are peace diplomacy, and we are going to need conflict resolution in the time that we have ahead of us. In addition to the conflicts that we already know, uh, I am quite certain that we will see the potential for more of them. The second point is women, peace and security, which is closely linked, of course, to the, to the peace diplomacy agenda. Our third priority is protecting civilians, especially children and also vulnerable groups that are especially prone to, for instance, sexual and gender-based violence, which we see an extreme uptick in the cases of sexual and gender-based violence now. And, and the last priority, uh, the fourth one, is the nexus between climate and security. And if anything, and, and that has also been part of the discussions that David and I have had over, over actually a long time, that when, when the scarcity of resources is paired and combined with potential uh, consequences of the pandemic, you could see a situation where more and more people either are hungry, are in extreme poverty, or you can see outright outbreaks of famine. This is something that we have to deal with. And I, I'm quite sure that many of these issues will land on the Security Council table in the next two years, unfortunately. Then to Robert Malley, President and CEO of uh, the International Crisis Group and former advisor to Bill Clinton and Barack Obama, among much else. What is, in your view, the health situation of the world today, the international, the international cooperation of the world? Has the development of the COVID-19 sort of given us reason to worry about the future? So first of all, I could just say uh, thank you for having me. I want to say what an honor it is to be on the same panel as the foreign minister and, and, and David Beasley. I've often said that if crisis group were a country, we would be Norway because of the values that it embodies and everything we just heard about, the focus on conflict prevention, conflict resolution. And then to, to, to David, first, congratulations for the, to him and to his whole team. Congratulations on, on a Nobel Peace Prize. I, I've seen David in action in, in, in certain uh, forms and I must say, I've never seen anyone more articulate, more persuasive. I would hate to be on the other side of the table if you tried to persuade me to do something I didn't want to do. So really congratulations. I think your question is, is, is really a, is the relevant one because we've seen as a result of COVID, but also the, the, the dynamics that preceded it, that the multilateral system was caught between, I'd say two narratives, a tug of war between those who were saying that you needed more multilateralism, more diplomacy, more work in common, more pooling of resources. And those who were saying, no, this is a time for each country to look to itself, for itself, because the danger came from abroad, from overseas. And in some ways, COVID strengthens both, paradoxically. The most, I would say, the more logical read is the one the foreign minister was giving, which is that in the face of a pandemic, the multilateral system needs to be strengthened, needs to come together, because you need to work together against, by definition, a threat that is transnational, multinational, and so you can't defeat it in one place unless you defeat it everywhere. You need to pull scientific knowledge, you need to pull resources, you need to share the vaccine, you need to address supply chains in a way that works for everyone. And you need, in light particularly of what both uh, David and, and the foreign minister said, you need to take care of those countries that are gonna suffer so hard, not from the health impact so much as from the economic and social long tail of COVID-19. But there is the other narrative and we, we would be mistaken if we ignored or neglected, which is those who say that the pandemic proves precisely what they were saying before, 
that the threat comes from outside, that we need to build taller walls, that we need to protect ourselves, that we need to be more isolationist to have our own supply chains that are independent from the outside world. That if a vaccine comes, we need to help serve ourselves first and not care about the others. And both, both those narratives take sustenance in, in, in what happened as a result of COVID-19. And I think what's at stake now and in the future months and years is to see which one of those narratives will prevail. And again, I think it would be a mistake to be complacent and to assume that because the logic in this room appears to be in favor of those who are arguing for greater cooperation, that that necessarily will prevail because you know the, the, the world system was in crisis even before COVID-19, precisely because mobilization for much of the world was not a good news story, but a mixed, if not a bad news story in terms of inequality within countries or between countries. And if the new system that's gonna emerge in the wake of this crisis, this crisis, this health crisis, this social crisis, this economic crisis, if, it, if it's not a system that is more inclusive as we just heard from the secretary general, that is more attuned to the inequalities, whether they're social or racial uh, within countries and within the international system, then the new system is not gonna be any more sustainable than the old one. You still have the situation that the, the forces of isolationism and, and nationalism is, is growing. I mean, it won't go away from one day to the other. And the basic reason uh, those people who carry on with this idea say is that they don't want to be ruled by a supranational organization. They're overruled in a way. So how should one meet it? I mean, what sort of challenge are we uh, heading for? So again, I think that's exactly correct. I think you do have, as I was saying, that, that other narrative that has taken hold that is very powerful because it resonates with people. It's not an alien discourse to tell people, you know, the outside world is bureaucrats, whether it's Brussels or elsewhere, are trying to impose norms and values and a system that is unequal, iniquitous to you. I think that's why the, people need to take that at heart and understand that the challenge is not going back to the future, to the past, but building uh, uh, something different. Now, I must say we have seen, even amidst this crisis in multilateralism and multi, in, in, in the multilateral system, we have seen efforts succeed. We've seen efforts of countries coming together to retain what they could from the uh, Paris Climate Accords, even when not everyone was on board. We've seen efforts to preserve the Iran nuclear deal, even when everyone was not on board. We've seen efforts to, to pull resources at the EU, to pull resources together to help countries that are in need of, of support in the wake of, of COVID-19. So that struggle continues, but as you said, precisely because the nativist, populist, uh, sometimes xenophobic uh, uh, narrative has not succumbed, has not lost. You know, my, my country, the United States, we've seen very clearly a very strong divide. And, and you know, not, I, I don't think that we should look at one as a black and white. Those who voted for, for, for President Trump were expressing a number of them, deep grievances that need to be uh, addressed, not in the way that some would want them to be addressed in a more isolationist, xenophobic, nativist way, but in a way that understands that those who are left on the side of the road also need to be taken into account. And again, that's not just within societies, but within the international system, because many countries have been left on the sidelines of this global order, have suffered from its inequalities, whether it is the inequalities that are inherent in the UN system, by definition, gives more power to some and to others or the inequalities in the international monetary global financial system, which also gives more power to some at the expense of others. So the, the, the battle will be, it's, it's one of every day to try to focus on the benefits of a, of a greater multilateral cooperative system, but also understanding its flaws and trying to address them. I suppose it's in the human nature to slide into sort of complacency when things go right. I mean, when, when things are effective and the organizations work as they should internationally and there's no problem, people don't think about the problems that lies ahead of them in a way, which might come in a way. Could COVID-19 be what the world really needs to have its eyes opened for the problems facing the world and the joint uh, situation we are all in, in a way? I post that question to all of you, actually. Well, I, I can start, if I may, just, Do, uh, just a couple of lines. Um, because I think that one of, the, um, one of the big challenges on the international arena nowadays when it comes to multilateral cooperation is the need for reform and the need to reform from within. Um, in our white paper to Parliament last year on multilateral cooperation, we pointed to that specific topic as one of the threats to the multilateral system. The fact that 
today the system is not set up to fix the bigger challenges. And this was long before the pandemic. And you can just imagine now with the pandemic that even though the UN system uh, has been able to respond relatively well and relatively quickly, there are, of course, also big challenges to much of the system. And I think that WFP and, and David and his people here, they have shown to, to a great extent how they can be very effective, how they can get aid out and help people. But there are other areas of, of the UN system who do not respond uh, equally well. And unless we take some heavy lifting jointly to, to try to do something about this from the inside, this system will most likely just dissolve itself at some point. And I say it that strongly because I think that if all the nations who have grievances about the structures, and they are many, if all of them just pull out and not put any energy into fixing the system from within, then suddenly you will have more and more of either bilateral or trilateral or transactional strategies coming, coming about. And that's exactly the opposite of what we want to. I mean, one of the reasons why we support the UN system and, and the Security Council so strongly is because we think very deeply that conflicts, for instance, should not be solved between big powers alone. It should not be solved by, by might be put f before right. But if everyone just pulls out and no one really are interested in trying to fix things from within, then we will have a situation where the multilateral system, when we need it, and we do today, for instance, will be less able to deliver on, on uh, what we see uh, as the need today. David, can I ask you, uh, what sort of reactions have you, changes in the reactions have you seen to the work you do during this period? Have people been more aware of the necessity of international activities to, to help the need that occurs? I, I don't think there's any doubt in my mind, and I've, Secretary General, and I've talked about this, that uh, this episode that we're having with COVID is showcasing the reality of the need for a multilateral system. This is an opportunity for the United Nations to prove why it is a very uh, uh, responsible and needed player on the field today. And I think the UN is stepping up. There's always room for improvement. And I have sort of a general rule of thumb. I'm like, as I tell, and uh, Ina knows this, as I tell all my donors, if you can find somewhere where we're not as efficient and as effective as it, we could be, please let us know. COVID, uh, and, and I don't think this is going to be anything that we're not going to face other types of shocks in the future of different types. But we need to always respond, reevaluate. How can we be better from this? I always believe that when that, when a tragedy occurs and you you can't do anything about it at that point, how can we take it and be a better system? How do we improve the system? And what we're looking at now, for example, you know, it's one thing when you had a supply chain disruption, as I said earlier, in a modernized country where you've got all the the luxuries of life. But you can imagine when a supply chain disruption takes place in a very fragile country, you'll have destabilization. So how do we, how do we come in and assure and minimize those risks in a variety of different circumstances? We will have more uh, viruses in the future, whether it's five years from now or 25 years from now, but there'll be other things. And what can we do to insulate, particularly the individual homes or families or smallholder farmers out in the field? So one of the things that we're doing now is trying to design systems in these very poverty-stricken areas so that they have food no matter what the government is, no matter what comes their way. And one of the things we've also done, and this has really, I think, been a, a major breakthrough in the UN system. A lot of the systems that were designed that we work with today, which have been fantastic, let me be very clear, because we've reduced a lot of poverty uh, around in the last 40, 50 years, but we still have work to do. But one of the things is 50, 60 years ago, whether it was USAID and, and of course other countries followed suit in many ways, here's a humanitarian silo, here's a development silo mm -hmm. in foreign aid. Well, we're breaking those silos down because we don't face the same type of problems that we did 20, 30, 40, 50 years. We now have protracted con conflict with climate extremes. And so you don't know sometimes where the humanitarian uh, act starts and the development 
heart starts. And so we have to bring them together and we encourage governments, our donors, the NGOs, let's all work together for what's the good of the people out in the community because they don't care whether it's a humanitarian dollar or development dollar. They just want to get the relief, relief and support so they can be free and have a sustainable and resilient system. Robert, Ina was mentioning the need for reform. Has the UN organizations or other international organizations been too slow in adapting to a changing world? I mean, I think we're always too slow to that adaptation. I think that's that's a reality of life. And I think in the, in the UN system in particular, there are some rules that were established and, and those who benefited from those rules are gonna be very, very reluctant uh, to change them. I think we, we have seen adaptation. We just heard about it. I think the UN is trying to do more when it comes to its peacekeeping missions, both the way they finance and the way they're trying to take into account the politics, but no doubt systems by definition uh, tend to be resistant to change, particularly when they are uh, in the hands of governments that may not benefit from the changes that uh, that are going to occur. So, but I do think we now face a moment, and exactly for the reasons that, and it's not just COVID. I mean, there are a number of threats now, and they've been around for a while. With climate change being one that we've all invoked in one way or another, that are going to require rethinking the link between economics, politics, conflict. You know, the organization that I head, what we try to do is be on the ground and look at the intersection of all those factors and try to predict where conflicts may occur and what can be done to address it. And what can be done to address it is often not just one element, you know, that often is a tendency to focus on the military element. Our organization looks much more at the politics, the social interaction, the ethnic, racial, or other, or, 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 or other uh, dynamics, the, the role of gender and trying to understand at the most at the micro local level, not at the sort of the high level, but often at the micro level, what are the motivators of conflicts? What are the dynamics of conflict and what needs to be done? And I think that's one of those new way we need to think about it, whether that's the UN or elsewhere, which is to try to understand the motivation of actors, what leads them uh, to, to conflict, what are the, what are the um, sometimes the economic uh, reasons behind conflict and their economic uh, outflows of conflict, the, the consequences of conflict, uh, and, and then and to try to address those at the micro level. The UN is one organization that clearly is equipped to do that, but and so too are many of the regional organizations, whether it's the African Union, or others that have a presence on the ground and that need to think, given all the lessons of the past, given the, the, the new threats that the, the, the world is facing about how to break, as David said, those silos and try to have a more holistic view of what, what is behind both uh, uh, political conflict, but also what's behind some of the humanitarian disasters, which are more than often or not men and women made. You know. I wanted to uh, pick up on one thing that David said uh, at the end about the silos, which I think is a very valid point. When we made our new humanitarian strategy late 2018, one of our main priorities was to try to build bridges between the humanitarian aid and the long-term development aid, and also peace building, because they are closely interlinked. But believe it or not, it is controversial uh, in many quarters. And if you know that the average humanitarian crisis lasts for seven to eight years. You would also know very easily that at one point within those seven to eight years, this has gone from being a humanitarian crisis to a long-term crisis. And many of the crises, they come again and again and again. And I think both Robert and David could, <laughs> could subscribe to that. They are dealing with many of the conflicts and challenges that they've been in before. Um, I'm, I'm, for instance, looking at uh, the agenda of the Security Council today. 16 of the country situations were there the last time we were in the Council 20 years ago. It's just an example of how these things have a tendency just to, to continue and not be, be really solved. And if we're going to, also for the future, mainly think in silos, say this is a humanitarian issue, this is a long-term development issue, this is a peace issue, we will never be able probably to provide long-term solutions for these challenges. And it is not, I think, a, a, a smart use of resources either to have David and his people being constantly in the same conflict or crisis for eight years where they could have left it to others to do a better job in building uh, the society from the humanitarian crisis and, and onwards. So I think that we, we, have to, we have to focus a little differently. I mean, we have, from Norway's side, record high humanitarian budgets, but we're not able to cope. I mean, the, the number of people in need of humanitarian assistance worldwide is just 
growing exponentially. And after COVID, it's not going to be any better. On the contrary, if we're not able to kind of reframe our thinking a little bit, I think we will be left with many of these crises as humanitarian crises, as recurring crises for years and years and years to come. But I suppose the lesson is, as it always is, that nature is providing us with big surprises. It's, mm -hmm. it's, it's developing differently from what we expect. Yeah. And I, I would like you to, to elaborate a little on the enormous complexity about all these things. I mean, we're talking about disarmament, armed conflict, and effects on the environment, and the environment's effect on mm -hmm. hunger and social problems, etc., etc., mm -hmm. accelerating, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, what could we say about this situation? Is it going too fast? Are we sort of at a stage where we've sort of lost control of how we react to nature? Well, I, well, I'll let the question all to well, all I, of you. I, I, can, I can yield the floor or the screen, I would say, to either <laughs> David or Robert for, for a second. Robert, I challenge you on that, the complexity of things, how things are well, interrelated. Yes, you know, I, I always think things always look complex. They, I'm sure they were complex even in the past, and it's, it's, it's easy to, to believe that everything has suddenly become more complex. But I would like to take pick up on something that the foreign minister said, which I think is, is, is absolutely crucial, which is the, 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 the duration of these crises and how, and as you, I mean, to, to come to your point of complexity, you have layers of crises because you have political, often at the, at the very at the origins is a political crisis. Mm -hmm. It can become military crisis, then you, you add on to it the environmental climate change, now COVID. But if you think of, this may just mention four, Syria, Yemen, now Ethiopia, Nagorno-Karabakh, all of these issues at the bottom, at the origin, they're political issues that ought to have been treated politically. They, they festered. They then, for many reasons we could get into, become armed conflicts. And now we could imagine, again, with the combination of uh, COVID, in some cases, climate change, in all cases, the massive destruction that those four societies have been have undergone, whether it's in, in, in the Tigray region of Ethiopia, whether it's Syria at large, whether it's Yemen, where the World Food Program is doing extraordinary work, whether it's uh, uh, Nagorno-Karabakh, which is going to have to be rebuilt. In all those cases, when you add the layers of conflict that have been unaddressed for so long, mm -hmm. and then at some point explode, and for a combination of reasons, you can imagine for how many more years the people on the ground and then those humanitarians and others who are going to have to deal with it are going to have to pay attention. And as, as, as the foreign minister said, 20 years from now, we may still be talking about Syria, we probably will be at a minimum from a humanitarian point of view. Likewise with, 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 with Yemen, the complexity will always be there. I think the answer is to deal with these early in a conflict prevention rather than either resolution or humanitarian uh, attempt afterwards, because the cost is much greater, the, the financial cost, but more than that, the cost of the people on the ground. And as you say, things are gonna accelerate. Everything accelerates the transmission of information, which is a huge bonus, but also a huge threat when the when it's disinformation, when it's hate speech, when it's uh, fake news, and that exacerbates conflict. Whether it's the accelerating impact of climate change, whether it's and we probably won't have time to get into it, but the radical transformation that's going to be wrought by artificial intelligence, again, in some ways for the better, in many ways for the worse, in terms of the ability for 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 state and non-state entities to wage war at low cost to themselves. So yes, the world is gonna accelerate in ways that can be harnessed for the good or for, for, for much uh, worse purposes. But the answer is to treat these, or these, these from at the source and not wait for them to get much worse. David, how does this situation uh, look from your point of view? I mean, you have, for instance, the Sahel region in, in Africa, which is much affected by local mm -hmm wars and terror actions and you know what and a lack of uh, sustainable uh, government in, in the area which can, can, can take uh, take the situation into consideration how, i mean how how do you see that situation and how do you prepare for it to develop <laughs> you know i could talk about this all day long and the complexities that you're referring to and just the the touch on a couple things that rob mentioned was uh, go back to syria you know, I think Europe highly regretted that it did not get on top of that in advance because you end up with several million people migrating uh, with a small infiltration by extremist groups into Europe. And uh, I was doing a Trans uh, 24 show about a year and a half ago, and I said, if you think that was bad, I said, wait, you see the greater Sahel from the Atlantic to the Red Sea is destabilized, and you've got several hundred million people to be concerned with in a mass migration uh, into uh, Europe. 
I said, we need to get ahead of it. It's a lot cheaper. We have solutions. We have programs. And let me just give you an example in Syria. When you feed 100 million people on any given day, week, and month like we do, we learn a lot about what's going on. If I fed everybody in your neighborhood for two years, I'd know what's going on. We survey people. We talk to people. For every 1% increase in hunger, there's a 2% increase in migration. Now, we can feed in a war zone like Syria, uh, which is more expensive because the cost of transportation, of moving supplies in war zones. But we can feed a Syrian, let's say, for about 50 cents a day. If that same Syrian is in uh, Brussels or Berlin, the humanitarian support package is 50 to 100 euros per day. And guess what? The Syrian doesn't want to be there. They don't want to leave home. And what we know worldwide I'm a dad, you're a dad, if you're a mother and your child doesn't have food and you don't have any peace at all, you go do what you, you have to do to get it. If that means leaving your own home country, you'll do that. But they will move two, three, four, five times inside their home country before they leave. Now, that's Syria. Sahel is unraveling as we speak. Burkina Faso has now got ISIS down in the southern border, now controlling some of the gold resources. You got Al Qaeda in the north and other extremist groups around. It's just a perimeter now surrounding uh, the leadership and the people of Burkina Faso. And I can go on from CAR to Niger to Mali, and it's, it's a scary, frightening thing. But we have solutions. When we come in with the right solutions, because extremist groups, they use food as a weapon of recruitment. They will cut off access. And I've had more mothers tell me, Mr. Beasley, my husband didn't want to join hmm. ISIS or Al Qaeda or Boko Haram, but we hadn't fed our little girl in two weeks. What were we supposed to do? And so when we don't have the access, like we don't right now in Northern Burkina Faso, where we have uh, two villages, pockets, that are in famine conditions as we speak because of lack of access. Well, guess what Al Qaeda and them are doing? They're recruiting now. Their numbers are going up. And so it is complex. And I'm just giving you that side. Let me get into the climate extreme that's taking place in the Sahel. But Ian and I have talked about this many, many times. When we come in, particularly in the Sahel, and we've got like uh, water harvesting programs. We have rehabilitated literally hundreds of, hundreds of thousands of acres of land in the Sahel alone. And when we come in with food for asset type programs, coupled with school meals programs, here's what happens. Migration drops. Marriage rate of 12 year old drops. Teen pregnancy drops. Recruitment by extremist groups drops. I can tell you that's a lot cheaper than sitting back and thinking, well, why should I send my money there? Because if you don't, it's going to cost you a thousand times more. And these solutions are not so simple. They are complex, but we do have answers for them. You know, you said that. To I jump in. Sorry. My problem. No, I just wanted to say, because what, what, what David said is just it's so important. When you look at the Sahel, I just, just very, very briefly. We at Crisis Group, we, we, we charted, uh, we plotted a curve between the involvement of, of, of the military, whether it's local, regional, international in the Sahel, and the number of terrorist attacks, jihadist attacks, they both rose together. Now, that's not to say that the military caused it, but it's exactly what David is saying. That's not the answer. The answer is to understand how these recruit organizations recruit, why they're popular. It's because of deficiencies in, 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 in state delivery services. It's because of, of, of not non-distribution of food. It's because some, for some people, hmm. it's the only way out is to join one of these groups. We've interviewed uh, women and men, who, women in, uh, as well, who joined some of these groups because they're the only ones that offered them the kind of life at a time when the state seemed to be ignoring them. So I think that's there really is a lesson there that obviously the reflex is to is to pour in military force, and sometimes it's necessary. But it's not the answer, and I think the, the data over the last many years in the Sahel illustrates that as graphically as any. In, uh, when you say that, I mean, sorting out the, the political way out of these mm. complexity and to find a solution which is sort of taking care of all the factors coming in mm. is controversial. Why is that? I mean, is the understanding of the situation and the understanding of the actual problems differing from party to party or from political camp to political camp? 
Well, I think first and foremost, this is about um, principles. Um, and I think uh, that these are principles that are absolutely possible to align in a way that makes help good for those who need help and assistance. But there is no secret that in the, the aid community, there are differences about this in the humanitarian community and, and the long-term aid community. And I think that we have to try to overcome these issues. And I will give you one example of why this is so important. If you look at the situation on uh, climate and security, one of our priorities in the Security Council, the reason why we want to put this higher up on the agenda of the Security Council, because it is a, it's a tough sell today to, to get the Security Council to deal with this. Um, one of the reasons is that we see very clearly that when you have climate change, that potentially leads to drought, that potentially leads to food insecurity, and the fight for resources potentially leads to, um, as David mentioned, recruitment to ext extremists and terrorist groups. Then suddenly, you have a circle of big, big problems that one of them by themselves is enough. Yeah. You're not able to solve this chain of problems unless you see all the tools you have in your toolbox as one. You cannot isolate the humanitarian issues. You cannot isolate the political issues or the military issues for that matter. We, yesterday, we sent our third deployment of a Hercules plane to MINUSMA. We've been ramping up Mo a lot of our efforts in the Sahel region over the past years. Uh, because we see, just as, as David and Rob sees it, it's one of the hotspots where we think that potential conflict uh, can be even stronger than it is today, and it could lead to enormous consequences for people. Jim Mattis, when he was Defense Secretary, he, he said something about the climate and security nexus that was really wise. Um, he said a lot of wise things, by the way, but <laughs> one of them was this. He said, I, I tell the State Department that unless you fund humanitarian aid and long-term development, I will just have to buy more ammunition. And that's not a good trade-off. Mm. So, so I think that everyone has to realize that all of these factors are closely, closely interconnected. That's one of the reasons why we have not only ramped up our humanitarian budgets, we've also been ramping up our budget lines for fragile states because we know we have to underpin all these efforts along the lines of peace negotiations to political solutions, to food security, school and education, health and so forth. And, and I think that that, that right now um, we are in a situation where all of these challenges that we have today can be exacerbated further by the consequences, the long-term consequences of COVID-19. Mm. So COVID-19 has, in a, to a certain extent, an accentuated the, the sort of chain of problems which are there all the way around. Mm. But, but then what will happen when the COVID is over? I mean, I read in a British newspaper the other day, someone writing that 2020 needs to pull over and let me out. That's a good thinking, but it probably won't, will it? I mean, it will pull over, and that will happen in about a fortnight's time or something like that, but you will not be let out from the problems, will you? So, what can we expect for the future? How much has the voters, the politicians, the leaders, the organizations learned from this situation which might change the basic of thinking for the time to come? Robert, for instance? So, so two things. First, I'd say just as you, you know, we may want to put 2020 behind us and COVID behind us. COVID is going to stay with us again, whether it's the health implications and, you know, we all pray that uh, thanks to the vaccines that may end sooner than, than many feared. But both David and, and the foreign minister spoke about the long-term impact, the social and economic impact, which are going to be most devastating in some of the countries that were most spared by the health impact of the pandemic. And again, thankfully, a number of us feared that develop, the developing world would be hit hardest by the health implications. It doesn't seem to be the case. I think we have to be a bit careful with numbers and in some places it has been hard. It's, it's hit hard, but not as hard as, as, as the worst uh, anticipation. But the economic impact that we spoke about in the first few minutes, that's gonna be absolutely unprecedented, at least since World War II, somebody thinks said since the 1930s. It's global and it is simultaneous, which means that the countries that should be able to spend money to help the, the developing world are also going to be stretched thin because they have their own economic problems to deal with. So it really is going to be a crisis that's going to be with us for some time. And again, as we discussed, the economic problems of today become political and social problems of tomorrow. So we're in this COVID era, whatever we want to call it, we're in it for, for the long run and we need to take the right steps 
to deal with it, which comes to your second point, you know, are the right lessons going to be learned? And then I just want to echo what I, uh, repeat what I said at the beginning. I think there are right lessons that a number of people are learning, but we have to be aware of the fact that there are other lessons that people have taken from this. And unless, unless their sense of grievance, their frustrations are addressed, it's going to be this tug of war. And who knows who will win the elections in certain countries in years to come, because it's a very even split between those who realize we need to do something different about climate change, we need to do something different about pandemics, and those who either deny climate change or don't believe that it's the responsibility of the West, to be very simplistic, to take care of that problem, and let the developing world cope with it, or who believe that pandemics, as long as we have our vaccines and we have the, the social and economic wherewithal to deal with the problem within our borders, why do we have to care about others? And so to remind people what exactly what we've heard now for the last hour, that what happens in the Sahel, what happens in Afghanistan, what happens in Yemen, first we should care for humanitarian reasons, but if those are not enough, and for many people they may not be enough, there are implications in terms of how it's going to affect the parts of the world that can do something about it, to then do more about it. Whether it's migration, whether it's terrorism, whatever it may be, those problems will not stop because of borders. They, are, they originate and they, 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 they ignore borders when they originate, they'll ignore borders when they, when they have uh, an impact. And that's an argument that has to be made, that has to be won and, and that can't be assumed. You know, would it be an idea to arrange this sort of world summit for all the nations of the world to come together and find out what to do when this is over, when the COVID-19 is, is fading away? Well, it, it's usually called the UN General Assembly, but uh, this year it was, of course, uh, not possible to arrange it in the normal way. I sincerely hope that one of the lessons that, that people will be left with after this is to try to break the enormous paradox of this being a crisis that hits everyone, as Rob says, at the same time, with, of course, uneven strength, but the consequences, be they health consequences or socioeconomic consequences, hits everyone. At that time, there are those who argue and advocate for less cooperation, and they do not see the interconnectedness between the countries. And that's the big, big paradox, because it is namely and exactly that interconnectedness that makes it hit everyone at the same time, uh, even though with, with different strengths. So I'm hoping that even though things look bleak right now, we will also see the potential of more multilateral cooperation and better multilateral cooperation able to answer up to the challenges that we see will be one of the long-term results of this crisis. I, I always remain an optimist. I always remain hopeful, even at the gloomiest times. So this is really what I, I hope for. And with, uh, with, with good helpers <laughs> like, like Rob and David, I'm, I'm hopeful that we can get somewhere. David, are you as optimistic as Ian is? You know, we were talking earlier today about it, you know, like what Rob was saying, you were saying, everybody wants to turn the calendar on 2020 and get it behind us. And, and then a couple of us uh, were working on, a, on uh, in the office here today. And I said, well, well, wait a minute now. We won the Nobel Peace Prize in 2020. There's one good thing in 2020. But uh, I am optimistic. But I, I will say very clearly, we have houses on fire right now. We've got to put them out next year. And I remember... And uh, it was about late March, early April, and Tony Blair had called me and said, he said, David, you see more around the world than about anybody. What are you seeing out there? And I said, Tony, I said at the time, because you have to understand it was COVID was just coming on the scene to the West. And I said, Tony, I'm very concerned that we're going to make decisions about COVID in a vacuum and we can end up with a cure worse than the disease. We've really got to be careful here. We've got to bring all the leaders together to make sure we don't have a hunger pandemic as a result of the COVID pandemic. So we've got to work both together, not in isolation of one another. And now, the, and, and, then, and then as I talked to Tony and went through probably five or six countries, what would be happening over the next 18 months? I, for example, Ethiopia, uh, 50% of its export revenue is tourism. Well, that's gone. But you can imagine countries like South Sudan, where 94% of their export revenue is oil, prices tank. And we could break down each individual country with different consequences because of COVID, et cetera. And you begin to see an unraveling picture that's very disturbing. And Tony was like, my God, you got to go speak to, to the United Nations Security Council. And I did. And I went and explained to the Security Council that we really must look at a more comprehensive layout. And if we can do it, 
and do it right, we will avert famine and much more uh, destabilization and migration. And the world responded responded. The leaders put together about $19 trillion of stimulus packages, along with COVID packages, along with more food response packages. And they allow low and middle income countries to defer debt, at least for the while, so they could put that money towards safety net programs within countries. And I could go on and on. Well, that's the good news. We were able to avert famine in 2020. The bad news, it seems like it's all told, as Rob was saying, the economic ripple effect is really now just reverberating in some of the low and middle income countries, which extremist groups are exploiting and taking advantage of. And so we've got a very serious, significant issue facing 2021, and that is the needs have doubled. And the, because of the contraction of economies, there's less money available in a general sense. So the leaders and the world have now got to prioritize like they've never prioritized before. We can't fund every single program in 2021. And, and uh, Enos heard me say this before. It's my Titanic illustration. The Titanic, it, the ship is heading out in the open seas and they're icebergs, but you've got a broken tile in the bathroom and a, a little spilt wine on the carpet and a broken uh, wine glass maybe in the ballroom. Well, should we be focused on the icebergs or should we be concerned with, well, quite frankly, we've got to prioritize the icebergs. And the icebergs for the next year are really going to be famine, destabilization, mass migration. I do believe long term, if we get through next year and, and really address the issues we're talking about, because if we don't, it's going to have such a dynamic, devastating impact on the entire planet. But if we do it right, I think we'll go have better days ahead. I'm an optimist like Nina, and I know Rob is too. I'm, I'm always one that the sun is rising, the glass is half full. We're on the way to a better day, and all things work to the good. But goodness gracious, <laughs> it sure seems to be testing our spirits right now. But the Nobel Prize made us feel a lot better for the moment anyway. <laughs> Friends, ladies and gentlemen all over, this is the last words of this debate, a good last word, I'd say, David, indeed, but it will certainly not be the last we hear from the problems we're facing, the problem we're discussing today. But anyway, this discussion is over. Thank you so much to all of you. Thank you. Bye, Rob. Bye, Rob. <laughs>